So uh, I'm about to tell you about uh, Polish game dev sector. So my name is Stan Just, as already said. I have been working in this industry uh, for about uh, eight years right now, and I've been working on a dozen different uh, gaming projects, usually as a producer, and now I moved to R&D um, position at CD Projekt Red, the biggest player in uh, Poland, and I'm also representing PGA, which means Polish uh, Games Association. Uh, before I get to the details about the specific companies, I wanna I wanted to brief you on the on the history of Polish game dev overall. It will be a short thing, but I think that we can learn all from uh, from what happened the last like 40 years. Some could argue that actually it happened before. It started before, but let's start from the 80s. So in the 80s, uh, that was a very hard time for uh, to begin uh, your uh, adventure with game development during the um, before the 89th transformation. Um, the access to technology, the access to hardware and software was very, very limited. And um, the, the target market that you could have, it's just a local thing that you could do. You can uh, make a game and actually post a, a table at the street and sell it, but it will be still uh, got pirated and distributed on the other table because there was no IP protection law uh, in place at that point. So actually, only local distributors, uh, distributors thrived at that age. Also, that continued in the 90s. Uh, you had to mm, become legal at that point, and some companies uh, take leverage on that. Having, um, having big players still hesitant uh, before, uh, with the entering the market of Poland, we are 38 million, so we're quite a big country, but still big players weren't sure how, the, how it politics will uh, come out, so they would rather sign a lot of licensing deals with local distributors to uh, distribute their games, to sell their games locally in Poland. Being a developer at that time was also very challenging because you were, uh, they were struggling with actually uh, getting their games out of the borders of Poland. So they were also, again, limited to the local market. And what they could do, they could uh, some sign deals, uh, publishing deals, which weren't very uh, profitable for them um, with uh, Western, Western uh, distributors, Western partners. But it, it, um, it gave them know-how and gave them skills to actually continue working on that path. And we have some people that uh, came from that age and have a lot of experience and are running companies right now in Poland. And it actually started, really kicked off uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, moving from small um, projects, independent projects, to outsourcing deals, also for Western publishers usually, and then getting those knowledge, uh, um, accumulating this equity um, from distributing deals or outsourcing deals, made them bold enough to actually start first big independent projects. And this is how uh, Techland um, proceeded, this is how CD Projekt proceeded. And 2010-2017, uh, I wrote here reaching the top, meaning the top of the quality, uh, having in mind 2015 in particular, the release of Dying Light and The Witcher 3 uh, Wild Hunt. This is the time also where uh, indie scene grew a lot leveraging the social media, leveraging also the know-how and skills that were gained by uh, a lot of players um, already uh, on the market. So uh, going from the big company, uh, getting the knowledge, and then uh, going off on their own autonomous uh, individual companies. So how is it looking today? Well, we are still mm, uh, we're very good in regards of quality, I could say, and in regards of uh, creativity, but we are still falling behind in regards of reaching wider audiences and in regards of sales. So we still are far behind, um, even in Europe, we are still uh, behind uh, the importing. So import in Poland is still uh, higher in regards of revenues than export in regards of our games. 
And still, we are doing games for usually Western markets. Now we're uh, looking more, uh, more and more to China, the biggest uh, gaming market uh, to date. But, um, but still, it's, uh, it's not an internal market that we are targeting. By the last count, we had 331 studios. Most of them are SMEs, meaning small and medium uh, enterprises. And what is important here to note is that even though we uh, estimate that we employ around 5,000 people, 15%, around 15% of them are employed by two big companies, Techland and CD Projekt. And those two companies uh, both are Polish uh, by origin, and they incur about 80% of the overall sales. So still a uh, market dominated by two big players and a lot of, lot of talent uh, in, the, in the other indie studios um, that I will be uh, mentioning further on. We have since recently, since one, one and a half years ago, uh, very good representation in the form of Polish Games Association, a member of EGDF, European Games Developer, Developers Federation which is covering the interest of the uh, biggest and the most well-known companies. And also uh, the distribution of labor here, Indie Games Poland Foundation, which is uh, helping out, who's doing a great job with helping out uh, smaller studios start off, uh, fund their first project, and then uh, market their game, pro popularize and promote their game internationally. Um, and we also have a third one, uh, which is still uh, being established uh, around eSports scene, because it's still, uh, it is also very important, growing uh, very fast in Poland. We counted around 60 courses on uh, teaching game dev, although the report that has been published uh, two days ago about our industry says that we, as practitioners, we aren't very uh, happy with the results of those uh, those courses. Usually they are l of lesser quality and we usually, usually consider um, that most of the skills and know-how is acquired working at the company itself. Here you can see uh, the distribution of companies uh, around our country. So most of them are uh, in Warsaw and then a lower southern part of Poland, so Krakow and Silesia region. And you can see here a bump that we had in 2015, um, meaning two big games uh, being released, Dying Light and The Witcher 3, that actually moved us uh, to, uh, to a huge and uh, different uh, kind of level in regards of uh, sales. Now, in regards of support instruments, we have uh, some support for low-budget prototypes. As a member of EU, we usually we use uh, Creative Europe, uh, which is a great program, media development for video games. Uh, me personally, I'm also engaged in the training program with the Promised Land uh, event. Um, and the second small thing, development of creative sectors. It's something that our Ministry of Culture uh, collaborated with us together with the uh, Indy a foundation. It is a small fund uh, giving out about 10,000 euro grant, but having that for dozens of companies really, really helped and simulated, stimulated that, uh, that environment uh, working from the ground up. Uh, in regards of the big players, we have R&D as support schemes like tax relief and our pride and glory dedicated R&D grant program for games. It is called uh, Gaming, uh, and with a budget of 25 million euros per year. So we managed to fund a lot of innovative projects with that program. We are running the second contest this year and the third one was also in uh, preparation. So we are, we are leveraging here the approach that EU is supporting heavily the, uh, the, the, the notion of actually innovative and creating new things when you're using that to actually fund uh, the technology uh, behind uh, video games. So those are a few of the brands that you can recognize that were done in Poland. And that things that I worked uh, personally on are like Two Worlds, Anomaly 2, or The Witcher 3. Uh, but also other games are really, really uh, good in terms of quality and recognizable worldwide. 
uh, so crappy animation. Uh, the, the thing that we um, managed to do in 2015 was extraordinary for us, especially in regards of those statues. They're pretty impressive. And the things that, that we did and that I, I'm most proud of is that this is the 33rd, this was the 33rd Golden Joysticks Award. Why is it important? Because in 83, in Poland, we we actually not only had communism, but we had martial law introduced. We have curfew hour. So having that in mind, imagine the situation, the starting point, where in, in the States they gave each other uh, awards for having a best game, having all other games in place, where we had tanks on s military on streets. And that, th that was the starting point. And after 33 years, we actually managed to beat those guys at their own game and actually got all those awards in 2015. And this is an example that we can do it. Like we, as an Eastern European country, Eastern European developer, we actually can achieve the highest uh, awards and highest quality bar there is. What is also Im important is that after that success, and after all other successes also being done during that period, during the last two or three decades, we have become recognized by our own government as a business to reckon with. Like, not, not only, like, the notion changed, like, we aren't uh, anymore considered, like, you just play games and you don't do anything. You don't, you won't make a career out of it. Right now, even our Ministry of Culture is regularly giving awards for the best games that promote culture and that are creating culture through the modern medium as it is, as the games are. So the awards that went, uh, for example, to this War of Mine, uh, The Witcher 3, and uh, for example, The Bound, uh, are the awards that are really, really important in regards of the public recognizing the games as future uh, medium. Now, Going uh, to the success stories of particular companies, what we can learn from them. Starting from 11-Bit Studios, the company that I uh, was happy to work for uh, two years. And they actually started, originated from Metropolis Software. They're, they had a lot of experience behind them. So it's not like they founded in 2009 and then released a first game, Anomaly Wars on Earth, and that was a total hit, uh, especially on mobiles. And all of a sudden, a new newborn company succeeded. No, they had years and years of experience, a lot of games released before that, and uh, a lot of failures also before that. They, were, they are doing a lot of prototypes and they are killing a lot of games. Games that could have been good, but uh, they chose to follow a different path, they chose to follow only the best ideas uh, they can come up with, and they are succeeding with, uh, right now, almost every one of them. They experimented with multiplayer, they dropped that. Uh, they experimented with their own digital di uh, distribution platform, they dropped that. They specialize in high quality, highest quality, uh, strategy games, but what is very important about their approach, they are not uh, growing in regards of uh, the scope of the games. So they aren't accumulating equity and then going for AAA shooters. They, they focus their attention to what they do best. And uh, so, for example, you probably won't see uh, anytime soon uh, them doing the strategy of a size like Civilization or something like that. But you will see, uh, for example, Frostbank, a strategy that will be tailored uh, in a very, very smart manner so that you will enjoy the heck out of it, but still uh, it will be very, very focused. So this is a very, very important lesson from them. Specialize in something that's um, particular and niche, but do it with the highest quality. With Techland, Techland had a different story. They grew as a distributor and uh, on distribution and localization back in the 90s. Then they accumulated enough equity to actually move to development. And uh, what they did is that they actually followed the right path, by the book kind of a path. They made games, they made more games, larger games. And after making like more than 20 games, they uh, moved to AAAs. 
and then they had the knowledge, then had the know-how. They are operating on a proprietary engine named Chrome, and I believe they have like a fifth or a sixth installment of it. So they actually have the the uh, capabilities right now to handle uh, the most demanding uh, projects. But what they do did is that they grew not only horizontally, but also vertically. They are doing publishing deals, they are doing distribution, uh, apart from doing those AAAs, and they are working right now on multiple AAA titles. So starting uh, from scratch, building up knowledge, uh, building up uh, capabilities, and then move to the larger projects. CD Projekt on that end, is uh, something uh, of a prodigy because it did, did everything wrong in regards to development. So if, if you are starting a company, you should start small. You should build up your know-how and then move to the larger project. So they didn't do that. So what they did is that they, uh, they, they did a very good job in the 90s and founded in 94, sorry for the mistake. Um, did very good job in the 90s localizing the games uh, and s distributing them in Poland. The games, especially done by, uh, by Blizzard, was very, very successful in Poland. And then they had enough equity to move to development. They always dreamed about it and the owners also knew that at some point, at the beginning of the, t uh, at the 21st century, the big players will come in, cut the middleman and actually distribute the game on their own. So they needed to change, needed to adjust to the new environment. And this is also very important, not to stick to, to what's, uh, what's uh, your core business, but uh, search and try to find and try to adjust to the new um, market conditions. And then they moved um, to development in 2002. So they started with a very, very small team team of like four people uh, working in Woods. So they wanted to do, they didn't know how to make games at all. Uh, they wanted to do a AAA using uh, like uh, proprietary technology with $300,000 uh, of a budget within a year. Like a complex RPG, and that's how they started with 2002, and they were confident that they uh, actually can do it. They didn't. It actually take, like, f took like five years. A uh, longer story you can, you can see on the recently published uh, documentary about the, how The Witcher 1 originated. It's on YouTube. It takes like two hours, so uh, you, can, you can spare a moment. Um, but, but what they did is that they struggled a lot. They failed a lot, but they uh, they kept going, kept on going, and then at the very very end, when they uh, had like a last breath, they released the game, and it was uh, success to the extent that they actually could fuel another one, and that that c that could be it rather uh, rather rather enough. I wouldn't say that it was a big sales success, or that it revolutionized the the market. It didn't, but it. Uh, established the team, it established the universe, and it actually gave, gave them enough confidence to pursue it further. They had a very hard time during the crisis. Uh, you probably heard about uh, the game uh, being cancelled, uh, The Rise of the Wild Wolf, and because it was... They tried to actually do it um, uh, through outsourcing, so that failed. Uh, then they released uh, The Witcher 2, which succeeded in 2011, but also, and th that was actually also a big step, but also failed in many ways. And it also was a struggle actually to finish. Then they uh, tried to uh, do some MOBA on mobiles, it failed. Uh, started, uh, tried to do some other things which weren't public and also failed. Then they uh, did um, The Witcher 3, and the project that I was involved in. Uh, which was also postponed several times with uh, proprietary technology on multiple platforms for the first time because previously those games were released on PC originally. And then the people that, that I worked with at that game actually described that as a creative chaos. And uh, as, as professional as this company is, there was a significant amount of luck that actually made that game happen and made that game as good as it was. But it also, also was a struggle uh, to, to some point. So 
actually, from that company, you can learn how not to do things. But again, you can you can admire the ambition, you can admire uh, the skills and dedication of the team that actually succeeded in a very very uh, difficult area of narrative uh, RPGs. The last company that I wanted to mention is something that you may not be familiar with, and but. They are a great company to work for. We, uh, we've done a s small internal surveys a couple of years ago as an industry uh, to, to find out which company is the best to work for, and they, they actually got the highest score. They, uh, they uh, are specialized, and this is the first sentence that I should start with, they are specialized in hidden object puzzle adventures. And that also shows you the diversity of the market. So some of the co companies are specialized in uh, action games, RPGs, puzzle adventures. Others are, for example, in strategies or in horror games. Um, we have a few, quite a few companies that, uh, that do that well. Uh, but again, from this company, they, they found a very, very small niche, the niche that many people do not believe in. And they excelled in that. They they did it really, really. They are doing it really, really great. And they are releasing a lot of games. They accumulated a lot of knowledge around uh, this little niche. There are also some success stories that were um, that were funny because they they came uh, they came as a small independent, even non-official. Uh, project Super Hot came out of a game jam. Timberman was done by just like few people uh, after hours, and they actually uh, got attention, to, got traction using social media and uh, nowadays. And they are keeping to their sizes. They're uh, benefiting by uh, by the success that they did. Uh, but uh, but this is uh, I'm, I'm mentioning those stories because this is also. Uh, something very, uh, very interesting, s stigmatic for the times that we are living in. Uh, you can succeed right now with a very original I idea, very original title, if uh, in the age of the social media, where you can actually get traction from Reddit, or YouTube, or or uh, or Facebook, for that matter. Lessons learned. Uh, the thing that I always uh, forget to, to mention is uh, that how they, those companies are testing their games. Here, here a small example of uh, how uh, CD Projekt is doing that. Apart from the huge, of course, QA department and just asking everybody in the company how they like the game and what they don't like at the game uh, about the game, they also this do this one trick when they invite or uh, or show the game. Uh, on just expos or invite journalists to the to the company and uh, show off the game. They always uh, do surveys. They always ask about the game. What uh, what for example? What grade would they give give to the to the application at that point? And what would make them to give uh, the game higher score? So you can imagine that if you are working on a game for more than three years. Uh, you are showcasing a game several times, so you can invite the same people, for example, from the biggest media, and ask them over and over the same uh, questions and actually follow their instructions. If they say uh, that you need to work on your horse mechanics, horse riding mechanics, then you probably should focus on your horse mechanics. And after your year, you're, uh, you're showing them that we improved in that, that, that manner, and now it's m way more funnier than it was before. So uh, what grade would you give right now? And they usually give higher grades. When the game releases, you actually have the same people grading your game that they did uh, already for, uh, for a couple of times. And they, have, and they also have their remarks being included. So that's one tip uh, of, of how, how you can uh, adjust your score, for example. All right. Have it all there. Thanks for your attention.